knowing these guys had explosives on him and he turns his back to me, I have to make a perfect spinal column shot because it if I don't kill him, I want him to be paralyzed. Super slow motion, I'm waiting for the damn gun to go off, like 45. And the next thing I know, bam, he, he throws his 45 right next to my ear and boom, makes the perfect shot. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear the combat story of Jim Horn, former Marine Corps platoon leader and company commander and 25-year FBI agent. Jim did two tours in Vietnam, surviving near-death experiences on several occasions. He earned a Silver Star in a company-on-company level battle on remote hilltops fighting suicide attackers, recoilless rifles, rockets, and calling in danger close rounds and airstrikes. After the Marine Corps, Jim went on to a fascinating career in the field as an FBI agent that included work with SWAT, a violent crime profiler, and leading the Bureau's trauma program. Jim doesn't hold back when sharing the special bonds he experienced with his fellow Marines, holding the line in these profound but common battles so far from home, and I hope you enjoy these down-to-earth and Oklahoman stories as much as I did. Jim, thanks for taking the time to share your story with us today. My pleasure. And just before we started recording, um, we, we were talking about how you have lived what many might consider a, a fairly violent life. Mm-hmm. And I, I wanted to start there in terms of, we're gonna talk through two tours in Vietnam, work with SWAT at the Bureau, and then helping people through some of the emotional trauma that comes with that. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if we look back at you growing up as a kid, would you have envisioned that that was what was coming ahead for you? No, not not looking forward, but in retrospect, it all made so much sense. Uh, my uh, my mother was our rock. She was a, a woman of profound faith. She she lived it. She didn't talk it. She lived it. Uh, my dad was a good man, but he was an alcoholic and. Uh, that, uh, that episodic stuff occurred every second or third weekend and uh, raised a lot of issues, totally affected the way, the way we grew up. And uh, in fact, uh, it, you know, it's a family of leaders. My dad was president of his senior class. My brother was, I was president of science club, vice president of math club, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, um, I learned so much from my dad and my mom who said it's okay to hate the disease and love the person. And so I did that. I don't know that my siblings did that, but, but I did. My dad and I were extremely close. Uh, we, we were fish, fishing, fishing and hunting maniacs. You know, we, we couldn't get enough of either one and we'd spend summers out in the boat. I uh, uh, had trot lines at the lake nine miles west of here and so every day you're out there which is why i've had 15 skin cancers and counting but uh um it it was really interesting and my dad would come home drunk sometimes it was it was it was not a good situation others he he waxed philosophical and one thing i heard repeatedly was his guilt over not serving in world war ii uh his friends all did. He was in college in the 30s. Uh, his friends all went in, and he had been hit by a hit-and-run car driver uh, on campus when he was a student, and they put him in the infirmary. They thought he was okay until his sister came to visit him, and he didn't know who she was, and then they went, uh-oh. Well, they discovered he had a fractured skull, and in those days, they treated it by opening him up. They took the fractured skull piece out and they threw it away instead of saving it and putting it back in the way they would do it now so he lived his life with nothing but skin covering his right side there the temple and when he'd get mad or or hot that would swell up and you you could see that but because he never served especially when he'd been drinking i knew the names of all of his friends who served and all the ones who died and Talk about survivor guilt. That was my first experience with that. And uh, I heard that so many times, I decided, you know, 
uh, we had World War II, then we had the Korean War, and uh, if, if our war comes, comes along and I have to make a choice, I'm going because I don't want to spend the rest of my life thinking the way my dad is thinking with, with guilt. And so uh, my brother went at advanced ROTC and he did his, he went to Vietnam in 65 as part of the advanced party there at Queen Yon. Um, and uh, I, I went a little different route. I went to Marine OCS, but that was kind of the driving force plus, plus Hollywood, John Wayne, my brother, my brother made the mistake of taking me to see Sands of Iwo Jima. It was the second time it came through because I was I was nine years old. That would have been in 1954. And uh, I watched that and I actually watched it, walked out of that movie and said, that's what I'm going to be. <laughs> and then I was dumb enough to do it, you know. Uh, but that's, uh, I always had that dream and I stayed with it. Uh, and that's, that's how I wound up in the Marine Corps. Our war came along and everybody, everybody back in those days, you had to decide. And yeah, there were 10,000 Americans who went to Canada. Um, and then one of my first cousins was a conscientious objector, uh, legitimate, and I respected him for that. He did alternate service and, and we stayed close, but uh, uh, I studied the war. Uh, I analyzed it and uh, in my opinion, uh, it was justified and fighting for freedom, whether it's yours or somebody else's, uh, uh, to me is uh, something that, that has to be done. It's, it's not free. And we're certainly seeing that in the Ukraine right now all over again. And, yeah. and it, by the way, I, it is really upsetting me that we're not doing more. That yeah. really, really is. And uh, I thought about calling the White House a while ago, and I'll probably still do that just to, to voice my uh, displeasure. Um, so anyway, that's that's uh, what I did. I signed up for OCS as a senior in college, and I could tell when I went in to sign up, the recruiters were there and they looked at me. And I think some people were going in because uh, they're going to flunk out of school or something like that. And uh, I can remember him said, "Well, what's your what's your uh, what's your GPA?" And I said, 3.2 And they both looked up at me with shock on their face. I think this guy's smart. What's he doing going to the Marine Corps? But anyway, <laughs> uh, back in those days, that, that meant a little more. And uh, so uh, if, if the September 67, I reported for OCS. So let me add, there are a couple of things that you mentioned that I wanted to touch on here. And yeah. actually, so I had a few follow-up questions here. And I think one is for your father. And I'm sorry if I missed this, but um, to your point on Vietnam, like everybody pretty much had to go. It was hard to avoid. I would the same as I think people would say is true for World War II. Yes. Um, it, for your father, what was it for him that he saw his friends go and he just did not end up going? Well, was it the injury? Hit by a car and he had a fractured skull. Okay. And took a piece of his skull out, so he was four F. He was so, absolutely. So he could not go. Got no. it. Yeah, he, he had no choice. It was medical and legitimate medical but it didn't make any difference in the guilt yeah. because, you know, when your friends go fight for their country and they die, that's going to bother you regardless of why yeah. you can go. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Got it. And then you mentioned um, respecting somebody for being a conscientious um, objector, which my first cousin, it, that, that makes total sense. And I, I agree with that. I haven't ever talked to someone about this though. So I, I was wondering if you can just share more, as you said, you know, you respected him for that. And I, I can see why. I would just love to hear it from your perspective. Yeah. Well, Brian and I were only born a month apart. And he was also born here in Stillwater, Oklahoma, where I was. And uh, his dad was a YMCA director. So, in fact, he was a director of the same YMCA that got destroyed by the Oklahoma City bombing uh, oh, wow. after he had died. But uh, anyway... Um, so we grew up, the cousins, we all went to YMCA camps together in southern Oklahoma and even Camp Wigiwagon up by the Canadian border for a month. Uh, and so uh, they were, uh, his, his dad was, was a pious man, my uncle, uh, highly respected, uh, worshipped by my, my mother and, and her sisters because he was the only boy and he was the last in the family. So... Brian was a very gentle soul. My cousin is very, very 
gentle soul. I knew he, I knew he didn't have it in him. Uh, I had an inkling I had it in me uh, when I was only five or six and I was playing with my brother and his, his friends. They're, they're four and five years older than me and we were playing cowboys and Indians. And uh, the deal was uh, when you got exposed and you got shot, okay, you're dead and you drop out. Well, uh, I shot one, one of them and he refused to quit and give up. And uh, then, then when, when they shot me and my brother was behind this, when they shot me, they go, okay, you're out, you're out of the game. So when it was all over, my brother went into the living room, he was sitting down on the couch and I was still steaming and I walked into the kitchen. I opened the drawer and there was a pair of pliers and I walked up behind him and I, I hit him in the head hard on top of the head. And had mom not be there, you wouldn't be having this interview because I would have died before age six. Literally, he was, of course, he was that mad. And I mean, I, I, I really hit him. It's a good thing it wasn't a hammer. I probably killed him. But anyway, and, it, and then I was, I was a little bit of a toughie as a kid until uh, Jerry Caldwell, my best friend, came along. And uh, we all knew he could kick my butt. But I stood up to him one time, and instead of fighting, uh, he, he, laughed his, he laughed it off, and we wound up not fighting. And from that point on, he was my best friend. Uh, but anyway, so I, I knew I, uh, I had a you know, temper, and I could, I could scrap. And so uh, I saw was that it a, quality. Jim, was it a temper, or was it a temper and uh, like a competitive spirit? It was, I've been told, I've always told us too competitive, you know, in sports or, or anything else. But uh, yeah, it's, it was, it was both. But um, yeah, there was, it was, when I got mad, I got mad. Uh, you know, I got hit uh, by an 80 year old man when I was 14 on my scooter. And he turned right in front of me. I, I went into the driveway on my side of the road to avoid him. And he never reacted. The collision took place two feet inside the driveway on my side of the road. And I, it knocked me out. And I came to and four women came running over. And this old man, 80 year old, he gets out of the car, walks over to me and says, you were going pretty fast, weren't you, son? And I knew exactly what he was doing. First of all, he, he tried to kill me. And then second of all, he wanted to blame me, you know, before the police got there. And it was the first time in my life I felt the surge go through my body. And I wanted to kill him. I tried to get up and each woman grabbed a leg or an arm and they actually held me down. He went back and hit the car until the police got there. Uh, but, you know, I had a switch uh, that, that could be turned on, no doubt. Got it. And then I, I think you mentioned you kind of go into the OCS route at the end of college. So presumably, you know, you mentioned your brother who's several years older, he goes to Vietnam in 65. Uh, I'm sure there was a, an opportunity if you wanted to go straight out of high school, or maybe there wasn't, but I'm just curious, why did you take the route to college um, at that time? And, and my family, uh, everybody went to, co to college. When you, you grew up in a college town, there was never any talk about doing anything other than uh, when you go to college. So we, we never even, my sister, brother, and I, we never even considered the possibility of, of not going to college. And, and it's so much less expensive when you live in the college town uh, that, uh, and we all, we, you know, we, we did very well academically. So uh, it was a natural thing to do and wanted to, to have a better life uh, and do better and, and make more money and uh, be more comfortable. So it never was not a consideration. And, and it, in my high school class, uh, you know, a lot of those kids had professors for parents. Yeah, and I would imagine. Very, very bright bunch of kids. And, uh, and uh, the large chunk of our class went to college compared to schools where there, it's not a college. Town. Yeah, that makes sense. The difference. Yeah. It was and, expected. And then, I'm sure. Yeah. And then the last thing just about your childhood, as you mentioned, you and your old man going out fishing and hunting. Yeah. Um, I do find it interesting as I talk to folks who spend time in combat later on, like yeah. how old were you the first time you picked up a gun and you were shooting at when you're out hunting? BB. You start with a BB gun. And then, and then my dad, uh, I was 12 when he got me a single shot 20 gauge, which I still have. And wow. I, 
when I was 16, uh, he bought me a, a lightweight Browning 12 gauge automatic. And uh, so I still have that. In fact, I had my dad's 20 gauge, it's got a poly choke on it, uh, Browning auto. And uh, so uh, we just, I loved quail hunting and squirrel hunting and rabbit hunting and, uh, and fishing. And we ate every, you know, we didn't have a lot. And so when we brought home fish or, or meat, uh, it, it was eaten pretty quickly and, and happily. <laughs> Got it. All right, so this is like all- Sar Sort of like Sarge and York and, uh, and, uh, York and Audie Murphy, you know, they both grew up hunting because otherwise they wouldn't have something to eat. Yeah. And uh, we, we weren't that bad, but it sure helped put meat on the table. I think the, um, the competitiveness, the, the survival, the hunting, all of this is making more sense how we track you into, into the Marine Corps later on. Oh, I love the OCS and, and officers basic school because it's all competition, you know. It's, it's and at that, at that time, I mean, you mentioned 67. So the war is, I mean, it's moving. That's yeah. got to be in the backdrop. What is the what was the, the feeling for you as you, as you go through that training initially, how like, are you just, Hey, I got to get out there and get into combat at some point. What, what were you thinking at that point in time? Well, I, w I wanted to be an infantry officer. I, I didn't want to join the Marine Corps and drive trucks or something, uh, you know, run motor T or something like that. I just, I just knew from, uh, I guess, Sands of Iwo Jima from that point on, and I had a poster in my room, uh, be a, be a, a leader of men, Marine Corps officer, uh, be a Marine Corps officer, have your own company at 25. I had my own company at 24. So <laughs> I, I even, I even beat that. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just, just something that's in the back of my mind. And, and we knew we were going to have to serve or, or flee. And a lot, of, a lot of my friends went into the reserves and stuff like that. And, and but a tremendous number of guys in my class of 63 from high school went to Vietnam and I didn't even know how many until we had our 20 year high school reunion and we were making a presentation to two of our guys who, who had severe PTSD and we gave them real nice plaques. Thank you for their service, brought them up, you know, and, and gave them a big pat on the back. And, and I just said, uh, how many of you served in Vietnam? And I thought there were five or six of us. There were 30 guys that raised their hands. That's wow. just the two were at the reunion. Yeah. So our, our class made a contribution and most amazingly all, we didn't have one single death, not one. One of our wow. guys, Marine, lost his Marine little brother over there and he's buried by my parents, but um, we were uh, unbelievably lucky. Was, was there any um, concern at the time that you might not get infantry going there or was it, hey, we need to get people into the infantry track because that's what we're fighting right now? Well, yeah, most people didn't want to go there, but uh, there, there was a, a, a deal, you know, if, uh, if you finished high in your class, and I finished 13th out of 242, that you got, you, you would get your MOS, and I, I asked for 03, yeah. as we call it, in the Marine Corps, and uh, so I felt pretty confident in that. I, I just felt like that was something I was uh, supposed to do, that I, I might be able to do capably. Uh, and make a contribution and I, I believed in the cause. I still do. I have lots yeah. of I have Vietnamese friends, my barbers Vietnamese, the, the people that do my feet are Vietnamese and I eat Vietnamese food and uh, uh, it became a part of me that I've never let go of. And if we then move into that part of your life as we as we kind of depart training and move towards Vietnam, um, as you're shipping out, is it Number one, pretty quickly right after training, you're sent forward. Um, and what is your, are you married at the time, Jim? Like what, what is, what's going on at home as you start shipping out? Yeah, I was, I was single. I was single until I was 33 years old. But, <laughs> but at, at officer's basic school, uh, I had a girlfriend in Georgetown. And uh, her family was uh, incredibly wealthy. And uh she really, really, really got attached. I had broken up with two women, two girlfriends before I even went to the Marine Corps. I said, this is what I'm going to do. If I make it back, you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, I'll, I'll look for you. And, um, but 
this gal got really attached and uh, she didn't even want to get, say goodbye there. She said, no, I'm coming to Oklahoma <laughs> to say goodbye to you and meet your parents and, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, my aunt, my aunt and uncle in Alexandria, Virginia, we've been, been on a bunch of cruising uh, uh, um, in the Chesapeake Bay and the Potomac because they had a cabin cruiser. He looked up her dad raising me and printed out the list of all the companies he was on the board of directors on. But it was funny coming from my background, she never mentioned it, but when she did, the shock for her was uh, it didn't make any difference. I didn't have the tart heart to tell her uh, it made a big difference because you and I are from different worlds. And I don't think I fit into that wow. yacht, the yacht yeah. world because I'm a, I'm a, a down to earth, basic, simple Oklahoman and we never had anything. So uh, it actually, it actually kind of sealed the deal for me. But, but anyway, uh, oh, the departure, very interesting story. Um, I, I remember driving back from uh, Washington, D.C. with three of my classmates when it came over the radio that Martin Luther King had been assassinated. Uh, I was actually very shocked that the other three guys uh, seemed to approve of it. That, wow. that blew my mind. Uh, but uh, then uh, our, Robert F. Kennedy got assassinated and, and really, really close friend of mine in the, the Marine Corps, Jake Jacobson, who's a retired attorney in Seattle now, but Jake and I uh, went through staging together at Camp Pendleton, and, and then we're in the waiting room waiting for them to say the bus is here, to put you on the bird to fly you across the big pond. We were watching the funeral of Robert F. Kennedy, and I was sick. I was literally sick. I told Jake, I said, you know, JFK, Martin Luther King, Robert F. Kennedy, I'm not saying I'd vote for Robert F. Kennedy, but it makes me sick that he was murdered. Uh, and I said, you know, Jake, I'm ready to leave this country for a while. Get away from Wow, it. wow, Vietnam. interesting. Yeah, I, and I, I, I said, I meant, meant it. So we, they flew us to Okinawa and the Marine Corps, you always staged through Okinawa and they put us through a little more training and the lesson learned there, they ran us through a booby track tra trap uh, uh, course with, uh, with some enlisted Marines. And I was the only person who tripped a booby track. So I said, well, this is the place to do it here where it didn't actually blow me up. And, uh, but I did learn from that. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it made me think, uh-oh, I may be in big trouble here. Yeah. So uh, then we, uh, we got on the, on the bus and on the plane and we, and uh, off, we, off we went. And, and so you arrive and it's, it sounds like individual augmentees, right? Like you're just one person in, one person yeah. out. Are yeah. you immediately a platoon leader at that time? Yep. I, I showed up and uh, that's what I was there for. And uh, I, I got my platoon there uh, at Da Nang. It was the base defense battalion. Uh, the misnomer was it was called first in peace. Well, because Marines didn't get any uh, liberty in Da Nang, got in too much trouble when they did. So there was no liberty. You didn't get to go in there. So they had two MP battalions, third MPs and first MP battalions. Well, first MPs was the base defense battalion all the way up to the High Van Pass and the whole Da Nang TAOR. So we did all that. We did the bunkers. We did the patrolling, the ambushing, and uh, and. Uh, receiving of rockets on a regular basis there. We, we lived around, we were on the south end actually of the, the airstrip, the busiest airport in the world. Every 28 seconds, there was a plane landing and taking wow. off. And uh, I had the, uh, I also had the morgue inside my perimeter at the, at the, at the north end, I'm sorry, north end of the runway. And uh, uh, my treatment of guys who fell asleep in the bunkers at night on watch, was we would gather up two or three of them and the, the lieutenant running the morgue, the army morgue, uh, told me uh, you can bring them, bring people over for a tour anytime you want. So the guys that fell asleep got a tour and they saw things that yeah. they never forgot and they never fell asleep again. So, uh, you know, we brought the war home to them because basically all we had to do, worry about was, was rockets. And let me tell you a great story there 
we, we also had the, um, the Korean Laundry inside our lines. It was run by Rock Marines, Republic Korea uh -huh. Marines. These guys were not to be messed with. At six in the morning, they were out there doing Taekwondo and, and nobody messed with them. And I missed it. One of the guys told me one morning, he, Lieutenant, you missed it. There was a fight. And uh, two rock, rock Marines squared off at each other. And the fight was one kick. The guy got a kick to the chest. The guy went down, turned blue. They, they were afraid he was going to die. And, uh, but he didn't. But that was the fight. But these same guys, the Korean culture is this. Our bunkers are, are considered to be uh, residences. And a Korean will not go into any residence without permission. So you would have rockets raining in, 140s, 122s. They would run to the bunker and bow and ask permission to come to the bunker. Everybody else is diving in. <laughs> and these guys are asking permission. You know, it's like, get in here. Uh, but but that was funny. And uh, But there was one time we, we ran to the bunkers, and there's a hooch there, and I have a staff sergeant standing there with a cup of coffee in his hand watching the fireworks. It's all, he's just looking around like this, you know. And I just shook my head and when it was over, I went over and said, excuse me, Staff Sergeant, but what the F were you doing? Standing there drinking coffee. And his response turned out to be a very, very significant thing for me. He said, well, sir, he said, this is my second tour in Vietnam. If there's one thing I learned from my first tour if it's your day, nothing you do is going to make any difference. If that bullet, if that rocket has your name on it, nothing you can do is going to make a difference. If it doesn't, you don't have to worry about it. And I looked at him and sign, silently said, he's crazy. I mean, he's crazy. You know, I turned around and walked away. But later on, when I transferred up, up north to 3rd Marine Division and people were dying around me, Every time that happened, that, that thought came up. And uh, about the third time it happened, I said, it must be true. I mean, how, wow. can, how can these happen right in front of you, right behind you, beside you, and you walk away? And uh, uh, I, the, the one experience I had up uh, there, uh, Da Nang at the bridge, they took the bridge south of Da Nang and and our guys took it back. And so I'm there with my platoon and a ranger battalion of Arvins who had been at Quezon. These guys were really good. It was 37th or 21st ranger battalion. And it was so a whole, whole battalion of Vietnamese rangers and my platoon. And I was standing uh, on the south end of the bridge. There was another bridge 2,000 meters away off to my, my right at about 2 o'clock. I was standing there and I saw the flash, the muzzle flash, and it was a 20, 20 millimeter uh, machine gun. And uh, you don't have time to react. I saw the flash and then there was a, there was a, a, a horseshoe pattern that went from below, down low on my right side, around me, over my head, no. I and it went down over here. And that's before you have, you know, then. Then you jump, but it's too late. It's you, you'd either be dead or, or not. And you know the twenties would just rip you up. And that's when I thought maybe uh, maybe I'm going to make it here because <laughs> oh. uh, uh, that was you know mind-boggling experience. So one of the things that you mentioned here was it, you mentioned the Koreans. You're working with the with the Vietnamese, but before that, you were saying you're down to earth, basic living Oklahoman. Yep. Uh, I don't know if this was your first trip overseas oh. or not, but it sounds like this would be a significant culture shock. Like, what was that like coming into this place and this world? Well, for you, I know you've heard this before, but all of us who went over there, it was so foreign, we, we didn't uh, consider it part of the world. So we referred to America as when I get back to the world, because <laughs> no one would understand how alien this is, the sights, sounds, smells, what's going on. Uh, you, you couldn't explain that to anybody who, who wasn't there. So uh, third world to the extreme. And uh, yeah, it was mind boggling. You stepped off of that. Well, Okinawa was the same way, though. When we flew into Okinawa, the, uh, all of a sudden there's water streaming on the windows. I said, guys, it's, 
it's clear and it's rainy. How can, how can that happen? It was the humidity. That's how high the yeah. humidity was. Yeah. And, uh, and then you hit Vietnam and, and especially in June, you know, uh, you get up there and it's like stepping into a sauna. And, uh, and that's the way it was from that point on. And you describe this first unit that you arrive at. And if I'm getting it correct, so th this is an MP unit. So you're on base, you're, you're basically guarding the base. Yes. And yeah. we had the whole tactical area. So we did the patrolling and ambushes uh, for the Da Nang TAOR, which is pretty okay. good, pretty good sized. Not, so not you get outside the, the wire. Absolutely. Oh, you're, okay. you're out in the village all the time. And, and that was our greatest resource. The Vietnamese friendlies, uh, they wanted to be close to the base. They felt safer. And they told us exactly what was going on and when it was going to happen. And uh, so we relied on them and they relied on us. How, what was the morale like for that first platoon that you took over? Just before we get into the first time you go outside the wire, but like, what was, how was the, the platoon at that time? Well, when, when, when I got it, I, I think it was uh, in fairly good shape. There was one issue and, and that was racism and it, it wasn't real bad, but uh, I, I, had, I made it, I had a talk with them. I made it very, very clear. My drill instructor was a black man. And, and, and one thing he got through our skulls, there's only one color in the Marine Corps and that's green. And so I said, those are the rules. And I said, and I'm, I'm talking, I'm talking in every direction here. I'm, I'm not just talking black on white, white on black, brown on white, you know, I'm, I'm talking about everybody. Everybody's going to be treated the same. I, I had a squad leader, E5 sergeant uh, from Alabama, and I saw him tighten his jaws while I was giving this talk. But you know what? He went with it. He didn't have any choice, but he went with it. And they all liked it once they saw this is the way it works. You're all going to be treated the same. If you're good, you're good. If you're bad, you're bad. And um, so uh, that that was very, very successful. In fact, later on, when my platoon was considered to be the best and then one of the other platoons developed a racial problem, the CEO said, uh, I want you to take over that platoon and get them straightened out. But who's gonna run your platoon? I said, Sergeant Jackson. Sergeant Jackson, E5, Black Marine from Mississippi. I said, yeah. wow, he's a leader. Wow. He's a leader, trust me. He can handle it. And I just kept telling him that. And uh, Sergeant Jackson, if he found somebody asleep on the lines, he'd go up and choke them out from behind him and threaten them. And then they didn't fall asleep anymore because they were afraid he, was, he would sh he would show up. But he, he knew how to lead and how to discipline. It was really funny, though. One day he says, oh, Jenny, he says, I really like the way you treat people. He says, you have a sister? <laughs> and I'm going... Well, uh, yes, but, you know, I'm from Oklahoma and uh, uh, my parents probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be too excited about that. So that was, that was the end of that. But I considered that to be a compliment, Yeah. you know, oh, wow. and, uh, and I, I've, been, I've been around the world with people of every color persuasion and, and we're all just human beings. Yeah. I've, I've talked about this a bit with some other folks on, on this program, you know, guys yeah. from Delta and, and different yeah. high speed units. And truthfully, like we have all this division in the U S right now, yeah. there wasn't a single time in combat where somebody like when they needed support, nobody's asking about anything else, color, your skin, gender, like yeah. who you vote for. It's just like, yeah. who's going to get me out of this and save yeah. me. They say there's no atheists in the foxhole. <laughs> there are so no, there are so no, uh, also are no, racist right you know that that's, that's exactly right that salt and pepper team that didn't like each other when they survived the night as of the next morning they were best friends the rest of their lives right i mean it that happened i saw it happen you heard about it and then you saw it happen and uh, yeah, yeah. I, I i frankly i don't understand racism somebody just said on tv a while ago when, when uh, people are trying to bring you down they're already lower than you are yeah yeah for sure. So, uh, you know, I mean, all the Asians I worked with and the Vietnamese and some really outstanding people hurts, hurts me to this day that we turned around, walked away and, and took away their funding and scuttled their efforts. Uh, you know, we betrayed them. 
and uh, we, we have a habit of doing that. Anymore. I, I was going to so, say, uh, you could be talking about multiple instances right yeah. now. It's yeah. not just isolated. I know. Um, I, I guess as, as we talk about your first time in combat, so we have a good setting of where you are, the, the unit, morale. Yeah. Can you take us through the first time you're going outside the wire? I mean, you must be, what, 23 years old at the time? Yeah. Yeah, of course, I'm four years older than my, my Marines, you know. But, uh, and that's a, that's a critical, critical age, 18, 19 to 23. Uh, the, our first experiences were, were snipers, which weren't any good. Uh, and, uh, and there was another incident in combat, but uh, the villagers came running up and yelling, Cobra, Cobra, Cobra. We went over and uh, there's a bamboo patch in the middle of the village. And I didn't know a Cobra could be 12 foot long, but they can be, in fact, they can be, a King Cobra can be bigger than that. I mean, every cell in your body electrified when you just looked at that thing and they wanted us to kill him. And that I, we couldn't figure out the ground was real hard. How are we going to shoot this thing without ricochet, without maybe hurting or killing somebody else? We, we put a guy on the, on, on a shoulder with a M79 grenade launcher and, and uh, that didn't work. So we said, we, we can't do it without risking uh, the village. So we just left, and uh, but then um, on 10 October, uh, the, the, there was a POL or, or petroleum uh, facility there where you went up the high bend pass on, on Route 1, and uh, sappers got in there and set charges, and they blew up one, and it started on fire. The other one didn't detonate, but I, I had to take my platoon there to secure that with the sappers and everything, and uh, and I took a piece of shrapnel uh, in the arm, and uh, the Marine next to me got a piece in his in his chest. And it was actually friendly fire. The Arvins, you know, fired too close to us as we were dealing with with a sapper. And uh, so that was uh, that's oh. when your bubble bursts. You know, you swing around. That thing went in, and and it wasn't white. It wasn't red hot. It was white hot. And I spun around and fell into a ditch behind me. And uh, uh, but the shocking part was the next next morning we were before the battalion commander, Colonel Brown, and he wanted to know what happened. And I told him, and I got my corporal next to him. He's got a piece of shrapnel in his chest, you know. And we were trained: be a man, know your stuff, and take care of your men. That was Chesty Puller's advice. Those are the three things you have to do if you're going to lead Marines. So I'm expecting to have a chance to do that, and then. Colonel looks it up and says, well, I guess, I guess you understand that since this was friendly fire, you don't get a purple heart. And I just stared at him and I thought, I wonder if he knows it hurts just as bad if it's friendly fire <laughs> versus enemy fire. But I never thought the same of, of him again. And of course, they have changed those rules since then. I never put in for another heart uh, for that incident, but I've still got the souvenir in my arm. And uh, <sighs> But for me, I failed to take care of my men because this guy's got a piece of shrapnel in his chest and he doesn't get a purple heart. Give me a break. Wow. You know, that's, yeah. Uh, that's not that's, right. But. Actually, two things there, Jim. One is, um, I'll come back to it, but you said that's when your bubble bursts and I want to talk yeah. a little bit more about what that means. But can you, yeah. can you say the three things again that you need yeah. to lead Marines? Yeah, man, know your stuff and take care of your men. Chesty Puller. You know who Chesty is, don't yeah. you? That's cool. Okay. Yeah. I, I've never heard somebody actually say those out. So that's, that's interesting. Well, you know, that keeps it, that, you know, the kiss rule, keep it simple. Simple. Stupid. It's simple. That's a, yeah. that's a very, very good kiss rule right there. Yeah. Those three things. And if you do them, you're, you're going to be a good leader. Yeah. And that was my goal. I wanted to be the best uh, Marine Corps uh, leader I could be. And talk to me when you said that that's when your bubble burst, what, I feel like that could mean several things. I just want to touch yeah, on Yeah, it's, it's the invincibility of, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then uh, and then when something penetrates your body, it's like, well, uh, you know, I guess I'm not invincible. And uh, it was a wake-up call to, to some degree. I mean, that, you know, there's no question. We, uh, we all knew going over there, especially Marines, uh, that what we were going to be doing and what the, what the chances were, you know. I told one girlfriend, I don't think I'm coming back. Uh, it's going to be a tough job, but if I do, I'll get in, I'll, I'll be in touch with you. <laughs> uh, 
I, th I think that was said by many Marines yeah. before shipping out. I did too. Yeah. And I wrote a letter and gave it to my sister. And I said, don't open this unless I, I don't make it back. Yeah. And then I, uh, when I got back, she, she wanted to open that letter. I said, no. no. Yeah. That's only, you know, upon my death. I was talking to um, a guy, actually a European citizen who went to fight ISIS in Syria. Yeah. years ago yeah and you know he was very close to his mother and so we were yeah. talking about like he wrote a note to it like the only thing he left behind as yeah. he was rolling out the door and uh yeah. those are scary to write but so many so many of us do yeah yeah those goodbyes are not easy you know i, I still remember going to the shop and uh, seeing my dad for the last time and we both knew you know as, cl as close as we were we we uh it was hard Oh, I'm sure. It was yeah. harder to say goodbye to him than I think anybody because he was my buddy. You know, we we did a lot of things together, and, you know, the good, bad, and the ugly. Uh, but I separated the bad from the yeah. good, and uh, the look on his face. Says it some all. some of his friends had lost their son, including our baseball coach at Oklahoma State, killed by a kamikaze, World War II, and and that coach coached one of our. OSU baseball teams to a national championship, but my dad said he never got over the sun. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Oh, my, you know, um, worse than losing a kid. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing's yeah. worse yeah. than that. Yeah. Um, my yeah. Uh, my father-in-law was a crew chief on loaches in Vietnam, and yeah. Yeah, so I had met my wife when we were in high school. So he's known me all through, like when I went to ROTC and into the military and before I deployed. So he yeah. would, he would often say like, Hey, you don't need to be a hero over there. Nobody wants to lose a kid. And it's the right advice. But when you're young, you know how it is. Like you just want to yeah. get into the fight and be part of it. So yeah. you're, you're trying to balance that. And it's not till you're older and have your own kids that you really think back at how hard that is. Yeah. One of the things we all went over this Marine, you get pounded, the tradition gets pounded into you. We study history of the Marine Corps. You know yeah. it before you go deploy, and everybody has one question. Will I measure up? Can, can I meet that standard? And that's what you're waiting for in the first, first combat, to see. Will you have the presence of mind? Can you do what you're trained to do? And uh, that's, uh, But you don't know for sure. You just think. Maybe you have confidence, but how can you know for sure until it happens? Was that that um, shrapnel incident? Was that your first time outside the wire? No, oh no, that was October tenth, and I'd been there since June. We we were out a okay. lot, and I even went out on some night uh, ambushes and LPs with the guys. Just just uh, you know, it's not your job as lieutenant, but it meant a lot to them to know that I would go out with them, and and we were always we were out on patrols a lot and stuff like that. And mostly it's friendlies there though, and. Uh, uh, I had, I did have one really tough experience there that stayed with me. I was sleeping on top of a bunker and the families, the Vietnamese families, they would put their hooches close to the wire. We had three, three separate wires you had to get through and booby traps and everything. But this, this family, a uh, young couple and a little baby were right up against the outside wire. And I was laying there at nine, probably about three in the morning. I heard I heard the rocket coming in and, and that loud crack and then the blood curdling scream of a mother and a baby. And that just faded away. That scream went on for maybe 10 seconds and then it stopped and they were dead. Yeah. yeah. That stayed with me. And, and I, I learned what a real scream sounds like. So after that, going to the movies, like, no, sorry. Good, good try, but that's not what a real scream sounds like. I saw a movie one time where they, they did, they got it, and it, fla I flashed right back. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. So in that in that first year that you're there, Jim, do you, I mean, because obviously you go back for a second. Um, was there? I guess did you have some of your tougher moments in that first year? Or did they come in, in the second year? Oh, yeah. No, the, with one exception, the, all the toughest things happened in the first tour, which was 
13 months. Uh, and and uh, I lost three radio operators in Vietnam, but the first one I lost, some would think this is ironic, but they're, again, trying to understand survivor guilt. Uh, Kenneth Schupman was short. He had a month to go. He was my, my radio operator and my driver. And he was from Oklahoma City. And he's going to get married in a month. He's going home to get married. And uh, I went on r and R. Christmas time. I went to Sydney, R&R, Christmas time in 68. And uh, a couple of days later, one of the other platoon manners come knocks on my door and he says, uh, Schupman's dead. I said, what? He said, he's dead. He said, the VC came in the village and the XO took your platoon, my platoon, and went out to handle the matter. Instead of sending, you know, a platoon, their platoon commander and their platoon, they liked my platoon, but it was the XO taking my platoon. And I don't know if Schutman talked him into it or he talked Schutman into it. Uh, you know, you need a good radio operator who knows what he's doing. But anyway, Schupman wasn't eligible to go out. If I'd have been there, no matter what he said, I said, you're getting married in a month. You're, you got a month, you're not eligible to go out. You know, this last last month, that was our rule. And, uh, but he went out, he got shot in the back by a woman shooting an AK-47 from the top of a roof. And somehow it went through that, at the old plated black jacket, the plates. Somehow it got through that seam into the back. And then because you're in this, this populated area, you can't fly a chopper in and out. And it took them two hours to get an ambulance there. Well, you know, the golden hour, it's gone. And uh, he's talking to him, am I gonna, gonna, am I gonna die? And, and he did. And uh, I still go to his grave in Oklahoma City. Oh. If I hadn't gone R and R, Schupman would would uh, would have come back. I might not have, but, but he would have. And that's, uh, you know, that's something you have to uh, live with. Man. I was having fun, a lot of fun. I In Sydney? Blonde eyes and blue hair, a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. That's, All right. that's the complexity of the of, of yeah. world, though, you know, a lot of issues yeah. that come up. When I went up north, I put in a form. Uh, I, I hate to say it this way, but I, I felt like I didn't join the Marine Corps to babysit the Air Force. I joined to lead Marines, and uh, I, I have confidence in myself. Uh, that's what I should be doing. So I put in, we call an AA form. I want to transfer to 3rd Marine Division. Everybody thinks you're crazy if you do that because you're going into Indian country and, and you know what it's going to be like. But I did, and I got up there and uh, to 9th Marines and... Uh, just in time to go out on Dewey Canyon, which was the biggest, most successful Marine Corps operation in all of Vietnam, run by the entire division, I mean, the, the entire regiment. Our, our division commander was Ray Davis, Medal of Honor, Chosen Reservoir. His son, Miles, was in, uh, was in our regiment. Miles and I were classmates. And uh, he wrote a great book, uh, by the way, too. And, uh, he was severely wounded, but uh, anyway, uh, um, Robert Barrow was our regimental commander, and even as a colonel, people kept telling me he's going to be commandant. And I thought, well, that's ridiculous. He's only a colonel. Well, he not only became commandant, he was one of the best we ever had, maybe the best. And then I had George Fox for a battalion commander, and George had been an enlisted Marine in World War II. He had actually spent time in Stillwater, Oklahoma training. So he knew Stillwater. He says, I love those rolling hills. He treated me like a son. So wow. I, it's the best situation any, any Marine Lieutenant ever went into. You know, Medal of Honor winner, division commander, commandant, future commandant, regimental commander, and a guy like George Fox, another totally down to earth, down to earth guy. Um, and, uh, that's, that's what I went into, and I was in the three shop initially because uh, they didn't have an opening, and then Golf had a, an opening for an XO, and I was the XO for Golf Company for a month, and then uh, Dan Hitzelberger was, was our CO, and he was a Naval Academy graduate, and I learned a, a 
treasure full of things from him. I, I watched every breath. I listened to every word. And uh, I learned a whole lot about him. So when he got medevaced, uh, he got a really bad infection in a, in a very private place. One of them oh. swole up like a softball. And uh, anyway, uh, he was out of there and he said, it's all yours. You're ready. And uh, so uh, that's how wow. I inherited golf company, which I had until I was medevaced 70 days later. So um, just briefly here, it, it sounds like from your company commander up through all the brass you could see you just had like this Professor. pyramid of great leaders there perfect perfect i mean there's nothing i would i could even dream of changing about any of them all the way to the division uh, commander if if you think Pref maybe on the the future commandant or your company commander was there one or two things that stood out about what they did that you really like like maybe emulated later or really tried to, to use? Well, uh, I, I guess I admired the respect. Uh, Colonel Barrow, first time I ever saw him, I, I was at Okinawa in the Oak Club. I, I went back there for embarkation school and I'm sitting there with all these officers, there's field grade and, and everything and, uh, and the brass. And this colonel comes walking around the corner and everybody jumps to their feet like they're uh, at boot camp because of this colonel. And that, that was Robert Barrow. And uh, wow, but nobody does that around here. But for him, and I said, well, well, tell me about this. And he says, he's gonna be commandant. Okay. I just laughed it off, you know, but um, Quite frankly, I'm a, I'm a, I have a little bit of Patton in me. Uh, I really believe this is wasn't my first rodeo. I think I've been there and done that before. I have those instincts and um, I've always uh, I've, I've always had them from, from the time I went over there were uh, there were instincts I had and I, I did a three hour interview at the University of Texas and they asked me what what prepares people for stuff like this? And I said, honey, I hunted all my life. So now I've got a different target, but I'm still, we're still hunting. Yeah. And uh, Sergeant York, Audie Murphy. Yeah. Same uh, thing. It's quite a bad, and you look at all the Southerners who grew up hunting and, and uh, it, it's, it's instinctual, uh, I think in, in a lot of ways. I don't know. So didn't answer your question probably. Well, no, no, no. I, I was just, it, it seems like you are able to learn from other people very, but, and, and you appreciate the, what they bring. And I, I don't think a lot of young officers do that. I think they think like, oh, I'm coming in. I'm going to, I'm going to take what I know and, and drive this forward. But it sounds like you're really onboarding and observing what's going on with these different leaders. So I was just curious if there's something you pulled out from that, from maybe your company commander or someone else. Yeah. He, uh, Dan Hitzelberger, the late Dan Hitzelberger, unfortunately, uh, and his funeral was in Annapolis in Patrick Henry's church and went back for it. Pretty special. But anyway, he told me when I took the company, he says, uh, you know, I just tried to emulate him. He said, I'm only going to give you one piece of advice. Don't ever adjust artillery if you're on the gun target line. You know, up there, you're in the mountains. So trajectories, you don't know. Is it going to catch here? Is it going to come down here? Whatever. Don't ever do that. And I never did. Uh, it's the only thing. That's I so did. interesting. Yeah. The, well, the one piece tragic. of advice. It's yeah. tragic too, because the captain who took my place had never had a command, you know. Uh, and I said, there's only one piece of advice I'm going to give you. Never adjust artillery if you're on the target line. He did. Uh, Willie Peter round landed in the foxhole with our Kit Carson scout and our true oh. boy, which is, used to be a DC who came over to fight for us root. And they were both very, very badly burned and riddled. And they both lived miraculously. But, uh, you know, he didn't take that advice. And that I'll, I'll never understand why. Uh, Jeez. The very first night he took, he, he, 
Well, we, we're getting ahead here, but look, maybe it's okay if we do. Yeah, that. go for it. Uh, when we went on Cameron Falls, we went back to the Ashall where Dewey Canyon was for the second time. So we're out there in May, and the Vies the North Vietnamese were gone, and we couldn't figure out why for a couple of weeks until half of my company caught malaria. Then we knew why. They all caught malaria. They're out of there. And uh, I had no, my XO was already in the hospital with malaria. I had no replacement. So it, this was by far the, ult the ultimate physical challenge in my life. Uh, I went down to 140, I'm 6'2", I was down to 145 pounds. Uh, sorry to be gross, but I yep. didn't even stop to lower my trousers anymore because I just had the runs all the time. Yeah, it, it was that bad. And uh, had I not been deeply in love with that little five foot two blonde hair, blue eyed Aussie, I'd have never made it. I actually said her name every step so I could take another step. But my, I've got my company and I'm, I'm all they got. And so, you know, there's, there's, there's no way out of it. And we get through with that operation and this captain comes in and the Italian CEO says, uh, so, you know, we got your replacement here, you know, so you can, you can go to the hospital and then he changed his mind. He says, look, this guy's never had a command. Can you go out on uh, Apache snow with us for a few days and snap him in? And then you can go to the hospital. And I, I, there's no way he knew what he was asking. He, I, I was sicker than a dog, literally. But I'm not going to say no to this guy, uh, George Fox. And so I did it. And uh the very first night, we've got a Medal of Honor winner that brings his battery in, Barney Barnum, Harvey Barnum, Barney Barnum, and he got his in Harvest Moon in 65. So we got the, they said, we're going to give you a break. We're going to put Golf Company in the, they reopen the fire support base, we're going to bring the Barney's battery in, we're going to have the battalion CP there, and you guys are just going to, you know, take it easy and protect us. And uh, we get a Chuhoy that comes in at 2100 at night and he says I don't want to die give up and uh, that's a North Vietnamese and uh, we interrogate him he says uh yeah there's my company of 200 is going to hit you at one in the morning and and they did and uh, so at least we were a little bit ready for him but to this captain's credit he looks at me and he says I've never done this before now most marine captains won't ask a lieutenant for help but he says, I've never done this before. Would you mind running the show tonight and let me watch? And then I'll take over in the morning. Sure. So that, wow. that's what I did. And, uh, but by, uh, by morning time, uh, you know, you're exhausted. I've been sick for two weeks with malaria, falciparum malaria, the one that kills millions. And, uh, and miraculously, uh, when they said no more birds are coming out, then one did come in, a 53, and then and I got out of there and went back to third med, and, and they got what the hell mortared out of them later that afternoon, and I saw the medevacs coming in, and all of a sudden, here's a bunch of my guys coming in off the medevacs. Uh, they got they got mortared, one of them came up, said, Skipper, uh, all that stuff you left, you're, you're uh, inflatable. You know, we had a nickname for them, I won't say. Uh, and, and your backpack and everything, it's all shredded because there was a, a, an 82 round that landed two feet away from where you wow. were. You'd, you'd be shredded too. So it was another one of those, thank you, God. Uh, and wow. I sensed inside of me I had to get out of there or I was going to die. I really did. I knew if I nothing came in, I didn't get out. I just, I just had that, that feeling that it turned out. It was prophetic. Mm. When you guys, when you got that intel that you were going to get hit with 200 people at a certain time, can you just, I don't know how much you remember of it, but like, what do you start doing at that point, assuming that you, you trust this intel? Like, how, how are you approaching that with your men? Well, we were very fortunate. About half the wire that had been, been put up for that fire support base was still there. So we had some protection, but you know, you're going all the way down to the fire team level and you've got everybody, you know, these are experienced guys. These are not guys you have to tell how to, how to have a firefight, how to engage another company. We've done it before and they were beyond belief. I can't, I can't describe how proficient they were. Uh, 
21 April when we got hit by 100 sappers, there were times when I actually leaned back in the hole and marveled at the fire discipline and the fire support. It was exactly what they were supposed to do. They were doing it. And, uh, you know, the pride in those guys and, and the appreciation for them, it's like, boy, good luck to anybody who hits this, this company because you're going to die. That's, that's all that's going to happen. Yeah. You're going to die. And, you know, we're in reinforced rifle, marine rifle company, and uh, we knew what we were doing. And, and the guys uh, performed magnificently. That silver star you mentioned, that's, I told them, this is yours. You know, I led, you did it. You're the ones who did all of it. All I did was lead and coordinate. And uh, they, they like that because they, they feel good about it. And I wasn't pulling, you know, I wasn't lying to them. Anybody who's been in combat in the infantry knows it's not about you. You know, it's the team, it's everybody. Medal of Honor winners all say that. Did yeah. you notice? Yeah. How about... If we talk then, Jim, about the uh, the Silver Star, um, yeah. just to be clear, it, I was trying to do some research. There's not great data on Silver Star recipients, the numbers. Um, so if you know it, please correct me. But um, the Army had far more than the Marines. But I think it's well known that these were not handed out easily in Vietnam, certainly not in the Marine Corps at that time. So... I can only imagine how difficult this event must have been, but could you set the context and kind of talk through what happened? Yeah, well, let me go with, in Dewey Canyon on the 5th of February and there for a while after golf company that I wasn't with yet, uh, suffered tremendous casualties and some hellacious battles, horrible situation where they had to carry their dead down the mountains for several days and stuff like that. It's a nightmare. They all still relive every February 5th. I hear from them. And I wasn't even with the company yet, but, you know, I later became their skipper. So, so we've stayed in contact. Uh, so I, when I inherited the company, we got a whole lot of FNGs, new guys. And uh, so we, they give us a bridge, Kajia bridge on route nine uh, out by Quezon. To, uh, to protect. And uh, so with all these new guys there, you, Marines you do a lot of shooting, getting ready to go to war. It's different to shoot once you're in Vietnam. So I had these guys spam firing all the time. We were shooting everything, we had laws and, and you name it. If we had it, we, we were shooting because I wanted them to, uh, the next time they had to shoot their gun at, at an enemy, you know, I wanted them to already have shot, the, shot it uh, in Vietnam. So we did a whole lot of that, and then all of a sudden uh, we get these orders uh, that Charlie Two has been overrun, and and you need to take your company uh, as a blocking force to these coordinates zero three eight six three one. And I looked at the map, and the time we had, I said we can make it because they had given me a map of high speed trails, and uh, that's that's. That's like a super highway compared to a, a cow trail, you know, for making time when you're moving a, a long distance. So I said, we can do it if you'll pick up our flak jackets uh, and helmets in this heat. We can do it uh, if you'll deliver it when at our destination. Well, I got the solemn promise they would pick them up and deliver them. And so we got there. And when we got there, it was three hilltops you couldn't put a company on, so I had to put a company on each of the three hilltops, being, being mutually supportive. And they said, you're not getting your flak jackets and helmets back. And uh, I suspect uh, that sealed the deal for the North Vietnamese. We have to hit them now. And uh, so uh, we're, we're all set up. And uh, my XO, who was uh, also my first platoon commander, uh, got the Navy Cross for what he did that night. He deserved at least that. But um, so Jay, Jay was uh, my XO and we're on the same hilltop. And I think that was providence and, and important because Jay was the best. The other two platoon commanders both made generals, but they will both admit Jay was a much better platoon commander. Wow. And uh, he, he was a Southern boy from Alabama who talked like that. And my biggest problem with Jay was he had no fear. 
He's former enlisted, went to OCS. And uh, my biggest problem with Jay was he, he would just stand there and look around, firefight like this. I said, Jay, get down, get down, get down, Jay, get down. All the time, you know. And uh, Jay was like, nothing's going to happen to me. And it never did. Jay got a Navy Cross and a Bronze Star and never got a Purple Heart. And what one day I finally told him, I said, like, Jay, I figured, I figured it out. You have a gold horseshoe up your ass. That's that's uh, <laughs> that's how you could do all these things and never get wounded. And uh, I told the sister of the nurse that she couldn't stop laughing, but it was true. I, I've never seen anybody like him since. Uh, but anyway, so again, don't get too close. Stay away from me. You know, we can't both go with one explosion and. So at, at nine, we, nine o'clock in the evening, we got probed and, and Jay had put a, an LP on the east side of the hill, thank God, right where it should have been. And when they had movement, they fragged, this, they fragged the movement and it totally screwed up the NBA. It was obvious they intended to attack us from the east. That would be the main thrust to get to first platoon. Uh, mortars were on top of the hill right behind me. Uh, you know, our CP is there. So that's, that's the number one objective. And that totally screwed them up. So they had, uh, they obviously revamped their plan. They spent the, most of, of the night then crawling around the dark to set up a different uh, plan of attack. And now they're gonna come up from, from the Southwest at the CP. Um, and the way they did it was these are sappers. There's a hundred sappers they have explosives. Um, attached to the back of their neck and they have these dark tarps and they have the tarps over them. So they move along the ground. You can't see, you know, it's nighttime. And, and uh, so they can get real close to, to the outside positions. We had defense in depth. Do you understand that? Yeah, I, so, I do, but it's worth, it's worth sharing for others yeah. who might not know who are listening. Yeah. So, so it's like bees. You've got, you've got, um, uh, a foxhole down here with Marines in it and behind it on each, both sides, there's, there's another hole. And, and uh, so that way, if they get through the first one, they have to deal with these two. And, uh, but because they were willing to crawl up, uh, they would lay down a base of fire on a hole and the sapper would crawl up there. They would cease fire. Sapper would jump in the hole, pull the stream and everybody went. So they were able to penetrate uh, our perimeter by doing that. Sorry, so, Jim, can I interrupt? Um, yeah. So I know what a sapper is from yeah. the US context, but the way yeah. you just described it made it sound almost like it's a, like a suicide mission. It is, it's absolute, it's kamikazes, except they're not in a plane. The bomb oh. is on their neck. And uh, it's, it's, it's like what, what the guys experienced over in the sandbox wars yep. was uh, blowing themselves up. It's the same yeah. exact. I, I didn't realize that. Okay, I didn't realize Absolutely. that was uh, something you were Absolutely. fighting there. Absolutely. So um, anyway, uh, I had the best gunnery sergeant in the world too, Gunny Kenny. He was so dedicated. He said, "I'm not getting married until I get out of the Marine Corps." It's a Boston Marine, classic Boston <laughs> admitted Marine. I love it. And he was a really, really intelligent, and you know, had had everything it takes. And anyway, he comes up. At four in the morning, uh, we're just kind of waiting, but I, I got to get some sleep. And he wakes me up at four in the morning and he says, Skipper, we've got movement. And uh, the next thing uh, that happens is the world explodes all at once. It was perfectly timed. Uh, they had a recoilless rifle northwest of us and, and I could see the rounds, uh, the red rounds, and they were, they completely knocked out our mortar team uh, right behind me and um, really sad story there uh, connected to the Ukraine, by the way, his mother was Ukrainian. But anyway, uh, uh, so the, the fight was on and it was, uh, it was vicious. And um, so they were able to penetrate, the, penetrate our perimeter. And um, one of the things I told them because we had writ with us, a Vietnamese, our, our, our Chu Hoi, who was invaluable to us. He, he knew things instinctively. Uh, I could even say, Rudd, is it gonna rain tonight? No, and he was always right. He knew, he could just, you know, he lived in it, so he, he knew. Wow. 
Uh -huh. And, uh, but he had a, he had a, he was a wealth of information and very helpful and very good. And, uh, I was really worried our guys would shoot root out of mistake. So, you know, the order was very strict, hard targets only, hard targets only. What, what does that mean? Sorry, hard Jim. Targets you... Mean you know, it's the enemy, a hundred percent. It's the enemy. And then you kill them, you take them out. And, uh, so maybe uh, down down below us, there probably wasn't any hesitation, but I, second radio operator lost was Maxie Jackson from Tyler, Texas. And Maxie's right in front of me. He's got his M16 and I've got a handset on both ears. I got battalion, I got company and, uh, and, and we've got illumination. So you, you can kind of figure out who's who. And I look over my left shoulder and there's a guy behind me over here. Uh, 10 feet away and uh so I'm, I'm i'm looking to see who he is and then i see the silhouette of an ak-47 swinging around in super slow motion like everybody describes and and he's coming around like this so i just ducked as far as i could let go of the handsets grab my 45 and duck and uh he opens up with his ak-47 and max he takes one on the head he's, he's gone real quick and so it gets hit in the arm and the guy stops. He has the company commander and the, and the CP dead to right, and he stops shooting. You know, he shoots three or four rounds, and he starts and stops and starts turning around again. And it's, it's again, you know, the question arises, well, the radio operator that wasn't hit is on my right, and so knowing these guys have explosives on him, and he turns his back to me, I have to make a perfect spinal column shot because if I don't kill him, I want him to be paralyzed so he can't pull the string. So I'm, elimination's going in and out. I'm squeezing, 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 super slow motion. I'm waiting for the damn gun to go off, like 45. And I got Rory Rogers sitting next to me, apparently. And the next thing I know, bam, he, he throws his 45 right next to my ear, boom, makes the perfect shot, perfect shot. And you talk about perceptual distortions and the guys who've been there and done that, they'll, they'll understand this. When that NVA hit the ground, he hit so hard, it sounded like they dropped him from a two-story building because sounds get magnified. Sometimes you don't hear anything. And other times, you know, a, a handgun can sound like a cannon. So anyway, that, that was my experience there. And uh, anyway, uh, wow, they came to die and, and they died, but because of, tactics you know i lost nine guys that night that's a lot yeah yeah we didn't really talk the. So, go ahead sorry jim i didn't mean to interrupt we didn't talk the numbers right so you're talking about a company size element that you're like how many people is that and then did you have a sense of how large the enemy force was that evening well we we knew from from the reports that of theirs that we got, it was a hundred sappers. They sat, they have support people grab bodies and weapons and drag them away, stuff like that. But there were yeah. actually a hundred sappers and we, we captured three POWs, you know, high, high value. And uh, that, that was a priority of mine. You know, if you can take them alive. And uh, I interviewed, I sat down with all three before the G5 came in to get them. Yes. And, uh, um, intelligence. And uh, I sat there and we smoked a cigarette and uh, they were young, you know, and uh, who are you with? What, what was your mission? And they all said exactly through the, the interpreter to attack Golf 29 at 038631. They knew who we were. We had changed our battalion. Brethren. No way. Just a week or two before they were listening to everything we did too. We listened to them. And not only that, they'd already broken the code. So they were, knew we were Golf 29 at 038631. And so I said, uh, how do you feel about coming down here? These are guys who spent the night trying to kill us, you know? So I'm, I'm really curious. How do you feel about coming down here? I didn't want to come. Why not? Because of all the friends I have who've ever come down here before, no one ever came back. You know, they, they were sent down there to die. And wow. so that was our job to facilitate that because you kill them, they can't kill you. And uh, that helped me a lot to know. I thought they hated us with a passion. You're ready to die to kill me. 
you must really hate me. No, they didn't even want to be there. That that was therapeutic for me. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, they they came and got those guys and interrogated them and uh, and they told them where the regimental CP was on the next ridge north and Second Arvins went in there with everything, even tanks, and overran the regimental CP and they got the uh, they got the situation report, the NBA situation of our fight, and they said uh, it said of the hundred sappers they sent at us. We killed, captured, or wounded 89. So they were obliterated, you know. Wow. That's why the guys, those poor guys never went back. So I, I had some compassion for them, plus our our supporting arms, the arc lights, the B-52 drops, the artillery. Uh, we got hit by artillery during Dewey Canyon from the NBA 122s, and uh, it gave me a much greater appreciation for what it's like to be on the wrong end of artillery. It's terrifying. When you hear those things screaming in and you're waiting to see if your history or not, where it's going to land, it is terrifying. So I can't imagine with everything we went through, what they went through was 10 times worse, Jeez. 100 times worse because we let them have it. If Jim, if we go back to that moment where you kind of turn around, you see the yeah. silhouette and, yeah. and you kind of yeah. narrowly avoid this. Yeah. I mean, we've already mentioned a few times where you kind of avoid death. <laughs> by a hair's edge yeah. um, for that particular incident was there i'm sure the fight's still raging so you probably yeah. can't take a moment to be like oh my god i'm still alive but right. if you did could you share that and afterwards did that ha did that moment stick out to you compared to these other ones it sounds like it's pretty foreboding because i worked with police who were involved with hundreds of police involved in shootings um, i could relate to what they said about how excited they got the adrenaline is flowing. It's very exciting. What George Washington talked about it. Uh, Churchill talked about it. You know, from his fighting days, uh, Robert E. Lee said, "It it it is it is well that that um, combat is so terrible, lest I would grow too fond of it." When your adrenaline's flowing, you can be confused. Like, is this fun? I'm having fun. All this adrenaline, and no, it's it's the adrenaline, and uh, it's not fun. But it feel you're you're excited, you're you know you're keyed up. You're 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 probably losing using another five percent of your brain. We only use use a very very small part of it, but uh, those perceptual distortions very likely come from the fact we kick in a few more brain cells, and so we slow everything down to incredibly slow. And I can. I have hundreds of examples of that from me and other and police officers involved shootings and bombings and everything. It's just uh, videos have been made about it. LAPD made one called uh, no San Jose PD perception of uh, perception of danger and uh, yeah. So uh, and that's the slowdown. The what you're describing the um, the distortion. Is the yeah, slowdown perceptual and... distortion uh i think it occurs because you kick in more brain we have, we have so much brain power we don't use uh but i gotta tell you it was exciting it, it, it was exciting that's uh not a shame to admit it because I, I i truly believe that that's what the adrenaline does to you and you can't pause you know one of the things they trained us with was a lieutenant. Uh, what now, lieutenant, was the name of the video, the training film. And people get killed. And they look to the lieutenant, what now, lieutenant? And the point was, you can't dwell on what just happened. You've got things to do, you know. And uh, you better do them right, because they're depending on you for their lives. And so you do. You stay in, in such an advantage having a billet because I had a lot of training. I knew what I was doing and I knew how to do it. And, you know, we're, we're coordinating five boundaries of artillery at once, two yes. illumination and three, three HE. And, uh, and that keeps you cognitive. Uh, you know, I didn't really get uh, emotional until, until they told me Seegers was die was dead behind me. Uh, and I, I went and looked at him and the look on his face, and I didn't understand until later why he died with that look on his face. But his mother was Ukrainian, 
And uh, in World War II, when the Nazis went through, they enslaved her as a 16-year-old girl. And, you, you know, you don't even want to imagine what that meant. Yeah. But anyway, uh, when the Americans went through there, they freed that area. She met a GI named Tommy Seegers Sr. and married him, and they moved. After the war was over, they came home to Rome, Georgia, and and had uh, three kids. Tommy Seegers Jr. was my mortar section team leader. Tommy was incredible. He was incredible. Uh, the ultimate professional. And uh, he got short. Tommy, you're not going out anymore. You know, well, his replacement got a bad eye infection and the corpsman says, you can't go out. You, you can't go out and, and take that mortar team out uh, with that eye infection. So Tommy being Tommy says, don't worry about it. I'll take him out. Well, he'd already written his mother and said, don't worry, mom. I don't have to go out. anymore." Oh. Yeah. Well, so then I get, uh, yeah, I write, you know, you get the condolence letters out and I get this incredible letter back, back from her in Rome, Georgia. And She's getting his medals and the presentation, a big article in the newspaper. And war has dominated the life of Valentina Seegers. And uh, she writes me this letter. She says, I don't understand. He said he was safe. He didn't have to go out again. Uh, but uh, Tommy died serving his country. And I know the price of freedom. And I'm going, oh, shit. You know. This is too much. Yeah. And uh, she said, when Tommy died, a third of me died with him. She had three kids. They had divorced. So it's just her and the kids. And uh, Jimmy, Christmas, that blew me away when I got yeah. that letter. I still got it. And, oh, uh, man. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. That's tough. That's really yeah, tough. Yeah, it's really it was brutal. It, it was brutal. Yeah. Jeez. And, and so... Is that, was that, that sounds like a horrible night. Was that the worst night that you faced there? Yeah, that was the most losses because of, they were ready for us and they could, they could, they could knock off the top of the hill and all, all our mortars uh, with the RPGs and the coilless rifle, which nobody saw but me. Nobody else agrees with me, but I saw it. And RPGs don't move that fast. It was, it was, it was bang, bang, you know, immediate. And that, that's a recordless rifle. And they had 85s or something like that. Uh, Jeez. So, uh, and, and um, yeah, the, uh, the turning point for sure was the artillery battery said we're running out of illumination. Well, that's bad because now you can't tell the good guys from the bad guys. And uh, as, as the article, the, the interview, I said that we started praying for spooky AC-47 gun, uh, gunship yeah. to show up and show up he did. And I recently met his son who came really? up to the water, who brought me a little packet of sand and I looked at it and I immediately knew this is Iwo Jima sand it's black you know and he, and he gave that to me but anyway uh, uh, his dad's gone but anyway I got to meet his son and the actual AC-47 pilot who showed up and so we've got all these batteries firing and what they do is they go in a uh, at 3,000 feet they just go in a circle and they've got their miniguns 6,000 rounds a minute and that puts down a, only one out of five rounds is red phosphorus and it's still a solid red ribbon down to the ground. And the sound when it's right above you is also ter terrifying. Uh, I, I mean, the enemy, I can't, I just can't imagine what that was no. like. It, it was danger close, they were close to us, but God, he was outstanding. And uh, that, that sealed the deal. Uh, they weren't going to win after that. Uh, but I asked the pilot, I said, um, do you want me to check fire? This, all, all these artillery batteries because he's he's going around circles with these artillery rounds coming. He says, no, nothing. You just keep on doing exactly what you're doing. Yeah. Dang. And, and that's an AC-130 or you're saying AC-47. AC-47. AC oh, Spooky gunship. Yeah, no, the old AC-47. Yeah, you can, you can look it up. Uh, the the adjutant of our American Legion here He's, he was a spooky gunship. I've got a hat. I've got an AC-47 spooky gunship hat. And they're the ones. Now, now you know, they've got the 105s in them and everything. Yeah. It's For us, it's AC-130 is what we, what yeah, we saw right, right. up there. Yeah, well, yeah. 
the, those that they brought those were kind of mothballed and they brought them back put the mini guns on them yeah uh, they were in front of them. that's you, cool you watched, you watched them work out around the name and those red ribbons and you know it was fourth of july mm -hmm. the difference that night was it's the first time i've ever been in the middle of the fireworks <laughs> yeah you don't want to be right in the center of that yeah and i i thought about it i thought about it. this is this is what this is like. I'm in the middle of the damn fireworks display here because yeah. it's colorful. Yeah. Oh, geez. Um, I, I'd like to spend some time on on what you did at the bureau, Jim. So uh, I, I don't want to sure. short, you know, shorten what sure. we can talk about from your time in Vietnam. But I guess what what caught me with your your bio and the research that I was doing is it looks like you come right out of Vietnam or the Marine Corps straight into the bureau. Yeah. Right. And you seem like you could have been the person who's, who stays in the Marines for a career. How hard was the decision to separate for you? It wasn't. Uh, I knew I, I didn't want to be a stateside Marine. That's one of the reasons I extended for a second tour. And uh, I, I specifically, they said, uh, I said, can I be the S5 civil affairs officer at first MPs for the Da Nang TAOR? If I extend for a second tour, he said, yes. So I extended and uh, that went well for six, for that second tour, except for the first night. And the very first night in my hooch, there was a Soviet 140 that landed right behind the hooch. Fortunately, those things are made to penetrate, penetrate the revetment so they can go up the jets, but they missed the jets and it came right over, right behind my hooch, right behind it. And, uh, it, 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 but it went deep in before it blew up. That's the only reason I, I'm here. And uh, it just picked me, you know, the concussion. You just oh my picked gosh, me up, yeah. Picked me up and put me in the middle of the floor and put shrapnel in my boot, but I didn't even have my boot on. But I walked, I, I went out the back door of the hooch and I put my hands out. It pulverized the dirt, it was fine black dirt. And it was so thick, I couldn't see my hands. Out loud, out loud, I said, welcome back to Vietnam, Jim Horn. And then I said, you may have made a very bad mistake. <laughs> I never had another close call because I was working with civilians. But uh, the other funny story is a guy in the hooch, sleeping on the cot or behind the hooch next to me. He gets a, he wakes up the next, he's dead drunk. He passes out <laughs> drunk on that cot. He wakes up the next morning with blood on his leg. He got hit by a piece of shrapnel. No. He, gets a, he gets a purple heart. And I, I've always wondered, what does he tell his grandkids about? I'm, just, I'm sure he's got some great war story <laughs> of how he's wounded in combat, you know, not, not passed out drunk. Oh, that's great. That is so yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. So, Actually, before we jump to the FBI yeah, time, yeah. when you come out of maybe either your first tour or your uh, second, yeah, yeah, and you reunite with your father. What was that like? We had a we we uh, met in Minnesota. My brother um, uh, was in uh, graduate school at the University of Minnesota, and so we all uh, uh, we all agreed uh, to meet uh, in Minnesota, and we were going to go fishing. Great fishing resort, log cabins, and everything. Play poker. We watched uh, we watched. Uh, uh, the landing on the moon, July 16th. Wow. 69 on a little TV, you know, uh, watched him step down there on the moon. And uh, so then I, I went to DC and I saw my girlfriend there for a while. And then I came came uh, back in uh, Stillwater a little time with my family because they flew you. The thing about special leave for 30 days, if you extend it, they would take you anywhere in the free world for free. Wow. Fly you all over the world. And uh, I wanted to go to Europe, but my parents had, had, had found out I was wounded. And there was a big article in the paper locally and everything. And uh, my mom had to see me. You know, yep. I, I have to see you and touch you to know. So anyway, I agreed to do that instead of going to Europe. Uh, but then I went, uh, stopped in LA on the, on the way back and and uh, you know about the Tate LaBianca murders, Mons Manson family? Well, that, yeah. that's what was going on. Oh. I'm, in, I'm driving around in LA, there's no one out. No one is out in the yard. People, 
I mean, it was really spooky. Everybody was scared to death after the La Bianca murders. It was like, oh my God, they're getting, they're going to get everybody. But uh, you know who Gary Busey is? Yeah, yeah. Gary was my pledge son in college. So anyway, I got a chance to see him and the band cool. that was out there. They went out there to make it, and they didn't make it as a band, but Gary stayed and made it, you know, in Hollywood wow. as an actor. So uh, I thought it was really funny. He says, well, I should be over in Vietnam killing gooks, you know. And I said, no, Gary, you're, you're doing the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> this is where yeah. you should be, not over there. And uh, then I went back for that second tour. Yeah. It, but actually meeting up with your dad again, um, yeah. How, yeah. how special was that for oh, you? Oh, we just, uh, you no, know, we were fishing. It was a fishing trip. You know, everybody <laughs> was happy. Yeah. You know, you develop a mind. Surviving is a mindset. Is a, is a mindset and I, I had the ultimate survivor mindset and it's, it's very competitive it's very aggressive and uh i completely wiped out my dad and my brother they didn't have any money left we were playing poker it's supposed and to be I a knew, friendly I knew what <laughs> i knew was the mindset i couldn't let go of it yet because i'm going back and i've got it and i'm going to keep it and then then i gave it back to him because we had to pay for the had to pay the bill and everything but that, that was pretty mindful. We caught a lot of fish, you know, big northern pike and stuff. And, uh, That's cool. We had, okay. we had a great time. Yeah. So th as you were saying, you didn't want to be a stateside Marine. So you make the decision to get out. Why the Bureau? Well, it, w it was easy. I, I thought I've had enough with guns. They tried to get me to stay and they asked me to be the general's uh, aide. And Carl Hoffman was the general of, that you would want to be an aide for scholar and a gentleman, you know, you'd have us over, play the piano, entertain us at night. I mean, stuff like that. And I was assistant provost marshal. And uh, I said, no, I, I need to get out. You know, I, I'd been through a lot and, and I yeah. knew I needed to, uh, to recover. And I thought, I'm just going to go to Europe uh, until I get tired of bumming around, then I'm going to come back. And, but what happened as assistant provost marshal, one of my, I was an operations and training officer for the in peace. So my job was liaison with the two FBI agents, Palm Springs, fantastic uh -huh. guys, great guys. <laughs> so they'd come to the base, take them to the Oak Club, eat dinner, played golf. They liked me and they recruited me and, and I really didn't want to do it. I said, I think I've had enough guns for a while. And but the uh, because everybody was getting out of the military in 1970, the unemployment rate in Southern California was 12 percent. Good luck. You know, not going to happen. So uh, I made up my mind. I'm getting out. I'm going to Europe. And they they call me up after I told them. They call me up. They said, "Jim, uh, you're hiring a thousand agents. Uh, the Omnibus Crime Bill Safe Streets Act. Thousand agents. Uh, you need to put your application in." So I'm, I'm going to go to your person and I'll come back. He said, "No, you don't understand. The FBI. The door opens. The door closes. If you want to be in the FBI, you got to put it in right now." Oh. And uh, so I went, shoot, and I did it. And uh, they said, uh, I, I passed the test, you know, I made 100 on the spelling test. They said, no, we don't take guys who make 100. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so I had to go for my interview, personal interview. And uh, they told me who to interview with if I could and who not to interview with. Uh, they had a tyrant there. Unfortunately, okay. I didn't have to interview him. But they told me something very important. Where are you uniformed? wear your uniform so i'm all clean and pressed you know uh i go there there's 17 guys there for their interview this is the final stage of being hired only two of us are in uniform we're the only two that got hired interesting right yeah. you get it you get a veteran's preference uh, of five points i had a purple heart i had a 10 point preference so i scored well and then that just uh, that put me up you know in the hiring category along with the other guy so we both wound up as FBI agents and uh, the civilians didn't. Wow. So there was a, you know, that, that's a pretty nice reward for going through what we went through. <laughs> yeah. that, that's your whole career, your whole life. And that's how I met my wife in the office of Denver in 1974. Well, yeah. it's, it's not like you were, you were given some cush job either though. I mean, you were still going to be in the thick of it in some dangerous situations again. No, no way I could have taken a desk job. Yeah. And, and this is how that stuff affects you and you bring it home. 
we were supposed to always have our seat belts fastened in our bureau cars. First off was with Seattle and the guys would say, Horn, what? why don't you fasten your seat belt? And I said, because I get nervous if I feel like my life's not in danger. That's a true statement. Wow. I meant it. So you needed that. Um, I mean, yeah. yeah. Hey, there's got to be a little bit of risk here. You know, over there, you know, any second, you know what can hit the fan. And especially when we were up north, because it did whenever they wanted to. You know, it wasn't, wasn't like you spent that much time fighting, but when it was on, it was on. And you usually you didn't pick the time. So, uh, yeah, I, I brought that with me and uh, I got cured of that when one of my wife's, um, my buddy's wife's was killed in a car wreck because she didn't fasten her seatbelt. And I had to do the investigation, get the pictures and everything. And her seven-year-old son is, has a bruised elbow because he had his seatbelt fastened and she's dead. Oh. I thought, well, I'll never, I'll never not fasten my seatbelt again. You know? Yeah. Yeah. He grew up without a mother because she didn't fasten her seatbelt. And I mean, spoiler alert for listeners, but you do 26 years at the Bureau, right? So it's not like you just dabble in it. I mean, you yeah, lived this 25. career. Yeah. 25. Yeah. 25. Yeah, because I retired in January 96 and I went in December 70. Okay. So, yeah. and, and in that time, and please, I, I think I'm going to get this slightly wrong, but you end up with a degree in behavioral, behavioral science. Is that right? I, had, I went to graduate school, George Washington uh, at night, you know, and uh, it's a, a master of forensic science degree. Forensic it's science. Formal okay. degree. There's no doctorate. So that's, that's where you quit. But because I was profiling unsolved violent crimes at the time, that was a perfect uh, graduate degree for me to get. It helped and a I, lot. Sorry, I was going to say, I bring it up because you dealt with this, the, the mind so much like personally in Vietnam. And then, you know, we talk, I think you do some work with SWAT, you're working on dangerous crimes. Like, um, did something pull you that direction to start looking at the trauma or that mindset? Or well, do you feel like you were just given that at some point? My undergraduate degree was psychology. So I was in Denver office for 11 years. And every time the behavioral science unit hasn't had an in-service, I put in for it. So whether it was forensic hypnosis, advanced criminology, no matter, no matter what, if it was profiling, I put in for it. Well, my boss liked that. He, he felt like probably that was one of my callings. And so I, I got all those. So my resume built and built and built. And so when they, when they decided, hey, we're getting swamped by the police departments who want these unsolved uh, violent crimes uh, profiled, we've got to hire four full-time profilers. And so I was one of those first four and John Douglas was a classmate of mine and John's the guru. John had abilities uh, that were uncanny and uh, literally. And uh, so, I, I had a hook there and John said, I want you to be one of those four and come back here. So I did and then I was there for 11 years, uh, profiled for a couple of years and then and taught for a couple of years. And then I inherited the trauma, running the, the trauma program for the FBI from 87 to 94. And that meant uh, responding to uh, handling all the, uh, the traumas, whether they were shooting, suicides, bombings, tornadoes, earthquakes, uh, you know, that was my job. Wow. So what, if you can, what makes a great profiler? As you said, John was uncanny, like in just better than others. Like what makes you good at that? Well, so maybe, maybe some instincts in John's case, he, he'd spread the crime scene photos out there. And he said, they, they speak to me. They speak to me. And you have to learn to study them that way. But so I get there in, in 83, I stopped here for my 20 year high school reunion. We take a group picture, we go out there. I'm with the other three guys. We're looking at cases. I get this picture in the class reunion. I say, you know, one of my guys, one of my classmates was a pedophile, been in prison twice. And uh, the other guys, the other new new guys, you know, they're saying, let me, find, let me, let me see if I can pick him out. So they're, they're picking out a position and people like that. <laughs> And I'm thinking, boy, those guys would really be pissed if they knew you were <laughs> on their nose. John's over in the corner. He hasn't seen anything, but he's, he's listening. So after they fail, John comes over. He says, let me try it. And he sets it down in front of me. He just stares at everybody in the picture. 
there's like 75 people in there, half of them are men. So you got to have one in 37 chance of picking this guy out, right? John studies this for three or four minutes anyway. Puts his finger on the nose of the pedophile. That's John Douglas. He's got a, he's got a brand new, you look up John Douglas, you're going to see all sorts of things. Uh, Mind Hunters, he wrote yeah, the book. I'm yeah. in it. And uh, he wrote the book and, uh, and he's got another book out and we, we stay in touch with each other. You know, we're classmates. Oh, and, uh, but he's the guy, he's really the guy that got me back to the behavioral science unit. And that was my leaning anyway, you know, with a psychology uh, degree. Uh, my interest in, uh, I, I was teaching post-shooting trauma in Denver before the FBI had a program. The boss, I said, can I go to the, uh, uh, the um, LAPD post-shooting trauma school? And he said, yeah, if you'll write a policy when you get back, and that's what we'll use for a policy in the Denver division, Wyoming and Colorado, deal. And, uh, and we instituted a policy of how you treat the guys after they're involved in fatal shootings. And uh, because the FBI had a habit of bayoneting its wounded after these shootings because of the way they treated them. And uh, you know, there's, there's no question about how people are treated, how veterans, combat veterans, military and police are treated after a shooting may determine the course of their future, whether or not they stay in or kill themselves or whatever they do. Jim, um, I've talked to several people on this show about in leadership positions, not officers, but in the military, just, you know, in different leadership positions. And some of them have said, hey, right after somebody's in a really bad fight, it's so important to talk to them about what's going on. Could you just share more about like what what happens in those moments when you were saying that they got it wrong before and you learned from it? Yeah, well, the inspection division was causing the most of the problems because they'd go out and say, what was your mindset when you shot the skyjack? Mindset. Where you, thought, you know, they were trying to trip them up. We had to kill a skyjacker in Easter 76 in Denver that came from Nebraska with a pilot and a mechanic was hostage and went on for hours and hours and hours. And, and I was supposed to take him between the little plane and the big plane, but uh, the big Condor 990. But when he came out, he put the pilot in front of him with a single action revolver behind his ear and over and under him, leg of the mechanic. And, and they just slid all the way across the cannon had him and then he saw me waiting, went berserk and he said, get, get back in the truck. I'd driven that ramp up, the old ramp you, you drive up, you know, above the truck. And so I had to let him go into the, into the plane and uh, the shooting miraculously, uh, I, I could go on about this, but to cut it short, the two agents hiding behind three, row three uh, engaged him. The pilot instinctively knew, he didn't see him, he instinctively knew I've got to get space between me and the skyjacker. He took two steps forward. And at the same time, without even being able to see, the two agents rose, engaged him, bang, 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 you know, sound like machine gun. And uh, he, he dies. He had told his, his, his uh, uh, captives that... Uh, he wanted to see his brother, and we brought his brother in from Grassy. He said, if they bring my brother over the plane, which we didn't do, I'm going to kill my brother first, and then I'm going to get as many of the FBI agents as I can before they kill me. So it was suicide by cop. But anyway, the two agents there on the third row, I went up, you know, I went up, stepped over the body. No question, he's dead. I stepped over the body to them. They're both sitting on the front of their seat. They're both, they're both this white uh, shock. And, and I know about shock and the first thing you do is you start talking to them. You know, I actually shook their shoulder a little bit, make sure you're okay, are you okay? And I didn't see any blood. I didn't think they were hit, but you know, you got to talk to people, keep them out of shock, shock can kill you. And so I, you know, I got them, I got them to respond to me, but uh, both of those guys in, uh, in those days, they, there was no program really for long term, and uh, one of them gained 40 pounds, and the other one thought he was losing his mind until he went and I told him to go talk to his priest. And he said he did, and then, now he was okay. And I said, Well, you must have a good priest. He said, No, I didn't talk to my priest. I, uh, that's too personal. I had to talk to another priest. But anyway, you know, whatever yeah. works. And they yeah. both got through it. 
Uh, wow. One of them became number two guy in the whole FBI after that. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, oh, uh, you know, I, I'd been through all this stuff. I had all the perceptual distortions. I had a lot of questions. Uh, the thing about my dad's alcoholism uh, was uh, it took me years to realize my dad made a survivor out of me. Yeah, I, I was surrounded by the best fighters in the world, in my opinion, and they were going to have to get through them to get to me. So I felt pretty safe. But uh, that survivor instinct uh, uh, attitude uh, I got from my dad because we, we had to escape and evade him on a regular basis. It got yeah. to be a game when I got old enough to drive and everything. He'd drive up in the driveway drunk. We'd run out the back door and the car was in the next block and we'd go to a movie <laughs> or drive around. And, you know, once a drunk falls asleep, nothing will wake him up. So we'd wait until he fell asleep and come in and go to bed. It actually got to be kind of fun. But, but you know, it took years to realize he, he made a survivor out of me before I ever got out of high school. And I, I still got that in me. I took it to Vietnam. Wow. I had it through malaria and all the other stuff. Jeez. Well, Jim, I, I'm going to let you get out of here. I got two questions I like to ask everybody. Sure. Um, so if, if you'll allow me, the first is when you were in combat, was there anything that you took with you, carried with you that had sentimental value, good luck charm, something that somebody gave you that meant something to you? I, I well, I, I put a cross, I'm not Catholic, but the only thing you buy over there was a crucifix. I put the rubber thing on there to make it soundproof and I put that in my dog tags. That uh, faith absolutely got me, got me through this. Uh, in, in some incredible ways. Um, and um, I was going to say something else too. Something else you carried or that somebody gave you? Oh, oh yeah. Well, my grandmother gave me a little red version of the New Testament, which still is right in there next to my bed. And I, I had that with me. She said, let this be your guide always. And so I felt like... Uh, that was where my my strength and my peace came from. In the middle of the carnage that's indescribable on 21 April of 69 with those sappers, uh, he said, only time the volume of fire of two companies going against two, each other was so heavy, I couldn't talk over the radio. I had to wait until there was a lull so that I could hear my platoon commanders and they could hear me. And... Uh, in the midst of that carnage, uh, I reached in and, and, you know, I got dead radio operator, wounded radio operator in the hole with me. And, uh, and uh, I realized, uh, you may not see the sun come up today. And I reached in and I grabbed that and uh, I looked up and I said, uh, you know, whether I make it to the morning or not, um, I know it's not up to me. I know it's, it's up to you your decision and I just want you to know whatever you you decide I accept your decision and in the midst of that environment I experienced what the Bible calls the peace that passes all understanding because how could you be that calm with this going on around you but uh, thank God my mother was a person of faith my, my dad's dad was a preacher my dad was the classic preacher son, you know, you go one way or <laughs> yeah. the other and uh, he kind of went the other way. Oh, uh, okay. That's great. Those, those are two great ones. Um, yeah. And the last question that I, I try to ask everybody, and especially for you, we, we talked about many near-death experiences for you, Jim. So, and we didn't really even dig into many of them and the FBI time, but as you look back at the people you lost, you know, we talked about people specifically by name the times you nearly lost your own life and the sacrifice, would you go back and do all that again? Well, yeah, I think, think we all would, unless we knew that the country was going to turn around to turn its back on our allies uh, and leave them the way we left them. Uh, I, I felt really good about what I did. Somebody, F. Scott Fitzgerald, somebody said, it's, it's a good thing to fight for your freedom. It's far better, even when you fight for somebody else's. And so that, I, we were freedom fighters. That, that's my take on it. And we didn't lose the war. We lost the peace because of our Congress. And uh, that's that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. That's my oh. view, and I'm sticking to it. That's just the way I see it. 
and uh, I, I always will. Uh, and I think an awful lot about the my chief interpreter. I've got a Buddhist Buddha statue on my uh, on my uh, patio for Sergeant Men, uh, who was from Hanoi. And when he was eight years old in 1954, he and his family walked 380 miles to the lot so they could live in a free country. And he was my primary interpreter and uh, most devout Buddhist you could imagine. And uh, he, he walked the walk. He was just an unbelievable person. My secretary was from Saigon when I was civil affairs officer. And Yen was uh, equally incredible. And twice a month, you know, these are the people they said, told us uh, they don't care about freedom and democracy. And she, twice a month, she would come in looking like she'd been through the mill all night. And the second time she did that, I said, Jim, Jim, are, you, are you okay? You, you, you sit? Oh, I'm fine. You, you look very tired. She says, oh, I have guard duty last night. I said, what? I have guard duty. She says, yeah, Hamlet. She says, I am one carbine and I have to walk perimeter all night protecting my Hamlet. Wow. Yeah, it says a lot. Yeah. You well, don't get people like that. No. no. Jim, and thanks I had so much 50, for the time. I had 53 time. Vietnamese working for me. Yeah, and they yeah. Got, when I had sure. that when I had that job, they loved, they knew how I felt about them, why I was there, and uh, it was a great experience. Thank you for sharing that with us. This has been fascinating. So much fun. Um, I know there's some fun fun times we we passed up on, but thank you for digging into some of these more emotional ones. It it was a blast. Thanks so much. And uh, Can I share one fun safe. story. Yeah, please. Do we have time. Heck yeah. So. We're, we're ordered to move to an old uh, uh, fire support base that's abandoned uh, so that they can pick. We're in triple canopy. You can't even, you know, use your compasses. And we have a hard time finding this place. But we finally get there. And to my dismay, when we get there, whoever was there before us uh, left a bunch of, discarded a bunch of uh, 60 millimeter mortar rounds, which the bad guys get in booby trap. So I was pretty upset about it. But we had a handheld... 61 millimeter NDA mortar, which was the best weapon in the company, because our guys could, could handhold it. They could use that thing and was unbelievably effective and they were really good. So I said, hey guys, why don't you just practice? We're, we're waiting for the helicopters. Why don't you just practice and shoot out all this old ammo? So there's three of us standing there and the guys are shooting the, the, the old rounds out. And then the sound you never ever want to hear a short round comes out of that tube, and I mean, it's short. And there's a big foxhole in front of us, and three of us, and of course, in unison, you know what all three of us said? Oh, oh something. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. And we all dive forward, trying to get into the hole, knowing if the short round lands right there before you get in the hole, it's goodbye, Brother Watkins. We're gone. We're getting the hole, we're probably going to be okay. And again, super, super slow motion. So I'm diving through the air and I calculate, you know, it's gonna land before we get in the hole. And here's how, how well you can think, believe it or not, I do this. I try to accelerate by swimming through the air and, uh, and I realize it doesn't work. No, you can't do that. I thought that was funny. I actually started laughing. And then my next thought is, oh my God, my parents, you know, the first thing they're going to say is, did Jim suffer? And I just, I said, I hope somebody says no. As a matter of fact, Jim thought it was funny. He was laughing when he died. Well, here, here's the good part. Because it didn't go far enough, it didn't arm. So it just, fuck. Yep. Thud. No, no explosion. So we, we all land. I, I stand up laughing now. These two Marines next to me, I may be their CEO. They are not amused by my laughter. In fact, the look they gave me was, you better tell us why we're laughing or we're going to beat the crap out of you. Because this was not funny. And I told them they didn't think it was funny, but that, that was the end of it. But again, how, how long did all that take? A second or two? And I went through all of that. that the mind expands. It really yes. is. It really does. So anyway, uh. <laughs> yeah, wild and woolly. 
Maybe you would have died with a smile on your face. I, yeah, I think I would have. Yeah. Gosh. Well, Jim, thank you very much. Appreciate the time. And, thank uh, you. Best and, of and luck. I, I personally very much appreciate what you've done for this country. I see those things on the back there, and I have the utmost respect for everybody who makes that kind of commitment. I didn't have the I didn't have the nerve to go on the CIA. I'll tell you the truth. I said they're they're going to send me right back to Vietnam. This time I'll be by myself. I don't think I want to do that. You know, <laughs> I'll go with the platoon or a company of Marines, but I ain't going over there by myself. I mean, really seriously, I thought about it. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I, I'm sure they would have loved to have you out there on your own. No doubt. Our first comment is an email that we got from a listener. And it's uh, from, from Bradley. I won't share any more about that, but it's a pretty special comment here. He says, I'm the son of a uh, CW2 who was a Loach and Cobra pilot in Vietnam. I just watched the interview with Eric Brethen and was glued to every word. My dad passed away a few years ago, and I know he would have enjoyed the video. He didn't share all of his experiences with me, but interviews like yours helped me understand his war. Thanks for your service, Ryan, and for sharing these. So um, I think it's reasons like that that we do this show. It's pretty cool to hear uh, somebody can relate to what their their own family may have gone through by listening to what somebody else experienced. And I think if you, for those who have listened to Eric Brethen's interview, I mean, 19-year-old flying loaches by himself in Vietnam and the crazy things that happened, it gives you some real insight into what that was like. Um, so thank you for leaving that, Bradley. Um, I, I know what you mean, especially having a father who, who was a pilot. So thanks for leaving that comment. I'm glad it meant something to you. Our second comment is from YouTube that AKA Brock left on the David Park episode. He says, I've listened to every episode on the podcast and loved every single one of them. As an ex-service person myself, it's so interesting hearing about the SF elements. These stories have inspired me so much. I've handed in my discharge paperwork, but hopefully I'll be joining the reserves. At last, I've heard you interviewed on the team house. Fantastic interview and long overdue. Keep up the wonderful work and thank you for your service. Oh, uh, that's great to hear. Um, team house is no joke, as you all know, and David and the work um, that he and Jack do there is great. And I was so grateful to be on the show with them. Um, so glad to hear you've listened to all these episodes and, and they still mean something to you, especially for somebody who's in the service and understands what it's like. So thanks for leaving that. It's great to hear the positive feedback and uh, you, you guys all stay safe. Thanks.